Bonsoir. Bonjour. Bons non, bonsoir. Bonsoir. Yes. Uh, so, thank you for taking the time to, um, uh, to give this interview for our association of continuum teachers. Um, and uh, so, um, we've known each other for quite a bit and, um, uh, and I, I know you work as a dance therapist, as a continuum teacher and everything you've been developing around and between uh, that. Um, <laughs> so, but today I would like to um, get to something like a bit more core, maybe a little bit more, um, not general, but a little bit of an overview of, of uh, what you've been doing, experiencing, living, teaching, giving, all the wisdom that's been carried through your work and through your life and through your own life. Mm. Um, and my, so my first question or my first like little inquiry would be at this time, what do you think is your mission now? What do you think or what do you feel is calling you? Hmm. That's a powerful question. My mission, what's calling me, I'm not sure that it's changed from what's always called me. I think what's changing is my listening, my receptivity and my responsiveness. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting question because when I was talking to my husband the other day, I sort of lovingly threatened him. I don't mean really threaten him with, with this. I'm going to abandon all of my clinical stuff and just start do, do working my medicine work, mm -hmm. the medicine work, because for years, um, and you and I have talked about this, you know, whether it was my mama, a spiritual in Haiti, or a shaman who I worked with in Samiland, or my current teacher in, in the top end of Australia, um, I've been, or even my original our teacher who was a Lenny Lenape, Native American, years ago. Um, all of them have said to me, what you do is just fine. You're good at it. But this is really what you do. This is really why you're here. And Manchun, my, my, teach, my mother in Haiti, she said, you know, you're, the word she used was a mystic. So I, I think the way I would describe my mission and the way I perceive it or sense it in my body is as a bridge, a bridge between cultures. I think it's interesting that somebody who was raised in um, Waspy, Connecticut <clears throat> in the United States, the town they wrote the Stepford Wives about, <laughs> um, or one of the towns they wrote it about, have, that I've always been so called by nature by the spirits that I see and feel and hear, Sanu Pawe, we say in Creole, the ever-present unseen, um, by mystical practices and more mystical spiritual traditions and religions. So I'm listening to that more because I think, you know, I think it's a bridge between cultures, um, between whatever we call this modern civilization, modern society, and the heart of some of the ancient practices that I also, I mean, I think this is an area of co deep connection for you and I, um, where we bond is, is, um, bridging that, you know, old yeah. and ancient technology for modern wisdom or ancient wisdom for modern technology, however we want to word, word it. So I think that's, um, I think that, yeah, that's a core mission, and I and I and I will always have the mission of um, supporting the voiceless to have a voice. Yeah. And I don't think they're distinct. In many ways, I've been very political about that and very clinical about that. Working with survivors of torture and war, human rights abuses. Um, but I think it all connects to the body as refuge and as temporary vessel dwelling place for the spirit. Yeah. And that's, that's the bridge. So, yeah. yeah. It's quite interesting that, um, that actually continue when we use sound and we use <clears throat> the voice and breath to um, kind of connect the field and, um, 
that sounds like another way to uh, to do that in a different kind of layer of reality. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know what that reminds me of? Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Please. It reminds me of one of my favorite books, The Spell of the Sensuous by David Abrams, you know, tracing language. And I, I have to reread it. It's been a while, but where he talks so eloquently about the origins of language mm -hmm. and I don't remember the number, but names, and it may have changed since he wrote the book, how many groupings of people, I think tribes are probably what they're called in the book, um, you know, still speak close to original languages, pre, pre formation of word mm -hmm. sounds and going back, how many of those sounds echo what we heard every day in the natural world, the bird songs, the wind, um, maybe the tide receding. So, and I think that connects a lot to continuum. I find more and more in my teaching of continuum and trying to bridge that because one of my missions is, you know, continuum, fairly, fairly small group that benefits from that practice really globally. And dare I say it fairly, well, pretty darn privileged group of people. Actually, I think very privileged. I am going to say it very privileged group of people trying to bridge how does that work get out into other parts of the world where the pureness of the work makes sense and supports that yeah. giving voice to and i think there's there's a thread there there's a bridge between ancient language mm -hmm. voicing spirit mm -hmm. and what we teach in continuum mm -hmm. and also probably also what you do with uh your work uh in dance therapy and uh, polyvagal and form dance therapy and and it's all it seems like this is all kind of a connection and also the voice you know as an activist you you're giving voices to to uh, and not only to human I mean you're giving voices to the animal kingdom as well and um, so that's really interesting so thank you so much for doing that yeah well, and more and more that the animal kingdom um, so, you know, our, our ancestor, our evolutionary ancestors, but I, I remember as a child, I was just thinking about this. I was remembering the first time I did any volunteer work, I was really little. Somewhere I have a newspaper clipping from the Wilton News, whatever our local paper was. And um, I was making my parents drive me every Saturday to the animal shelter to help take care of the animals and thought I would be a veterinarian and then was afraid of how often my heart would break. So I did other things, but coming back around um, to, yeah, to, to really acknowledging and recognizing that we are not masters of that kingdom, but very much part of that kingdom, stewards of, if our intelligence is, if we were meant to develop this level of intelligence, we get quite attached to as humans. It's clearly to steward, to tend to, um, but to connect to, and you know, Mm -hmm. Again, another place where you and I are so connected. I'll never forget that image of you with that bird that slammed into the window in France when we were at the retreat. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's what we're here for. Mm -hmm. And do you feel that all that is vibration? I mean, I'm just bringing this word mm -hmm. because it's, you know, it's, it's very much a link between old tradition and yeah. you know, their belief system usually talk about some kind of vibration, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, sound or, you know, something that, that happened and, and how we carry, well, you know, our, our human activities, like, you know, lately we had a kind of another resonance, another vibration, which was coming from the microbial world. Right. So, right. you know, I'm just wondering if there is, you know, uh, um, how we can engage with this work of vibration or, what, or just what maybe what mm -hmm. the world is about, how those vibrations are resonating with each other or connecting or making, you know, friction or, you know, you know, and I'm really curious to know what, how you sense vibration or sense of the field in your work with um, a, a war zone or all these type of really, Mm -hmm. uh, kind of scary story you've been going through. So there's several layers here. The, the thing, when, when you speak of vibration, what I start to see is energy moving. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, going back to continuum, um, I think at the level of breath made audible 
sound. We're, we're accessing the fact that we are energy. I'm, I mean, it's, this human species tends to be quite attached to the idea of form and matter. And we're just densely packed energy. Yeah. Um, I, I have not been as drawn to the quantum physics, but, you know, have, and that's certainly informed. I mean, I know that informed a lot of Emily's <clears throat> development of continuum, but knowing that quantum, like the smallest particles that comprise, that atoms are comprised of and then molecules are tiny, 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 tiny density particles. We're all that, everything the leaves, the flowers, the birds, the lizards, the ocean. And so um, I think when you speak of vibration, that's, that's where um, I sense the connection. And I remember even as a little girl seeing energy move mm -hmm. and then, you know, people going, oh, she's kind of whacked. So, you know, or, you know, talking about it. So silencing that, silencing my own voice. Um, and again, I just, I, one of the things that I've noticed in this period that we're in that started in, you know, f well, started in February, March, but really in November, but really probably before that with this dance that we're doing with the coronavirus. Um, I've been dropping into dreaming a lot more. And so that energy is, is even more, um, I'm just sensing it. It's not even a seeing, it's a sensing. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, um, that is where, we're all connected. And again, I think humans are so attached to form, whether it's my body ends here, or I take lunch at 12, or I have to be at work, you know, this time, I mean, all of these things that I'm like, who said that, you know, this is when these things happen. And then in terms of working in extreme dangerous situations, active war zones, disasters, I think that's where the sustenance has been for me. Mm -hmm. I think that's where the meeting places have been. My favorite places to be have been Darfur, the border of Lebanon and Syria, Haiti. I mean, I remember in the Haiti earthquake, one of my dearest friends who really knows me um, wrote me an email and she said, you know, I haven't been emailing you a lot. She says, I have a feeling you're getting a lot of emails, people going, you know, are you okay? And she goes, I know that you're in your element. I don't want to disturb you, but I'm here. And she so clearly sensed in those places, there's so little distraction mm -hmm. because the only thing to tend to is what's pure and elemental, and that is survival. Right. It drives me crazy that the Continuum community, I so many times I read our flyers, you know, we can rise above survival or, you know, survival is a gift. Mm -hmm. And there is an element of survival that is so pure mm -hmm. and fluid and not constrained because it's it's the pulse it's the heart of what keeps life going mm -hmm. so in those places i have felt very safe mm -hmm. because of that sense of being connected to everything energetically um i often would be with people i know i wouldn't have to say a word but i could just feel drop below the obvious cliche you know white girl in a black community or you know, non-Muslim in a Muslim community, all of those stories that we get attached to and form, dropping below them um, made those situations really manageable. I don't think, I, I can't even recall, there were a couple times where I had some, you know, like when I was dodging machine gun fire where I was actually, yes, this is a little <laughs> nerve wracking, but never feeling fear because in that place, there's connection and there's also the ability to detach from form. There's just less attachment to it. Right. You know, does that, am I making sense? I feel yeah, like I'm yeah, talking. Yeah. 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 It's, 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 I mean, thank you for asking this because this is stuff that, yeah, I don't talk about often, but there's something. And a lot of, I mean, you know, I've often said to family members, don't ever, you know, if something happens to me, don't ever like file a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. I'm willingly going into this space, you know, and my husband has always gotten it. He's always said, I don't worry about you because I, I trust you, how you move in those places. Right. And this is what he's referring to, even if he doesn't always know he's referring to it, that there's, yeah, yeah it's, it's that energy, um, war zones and torture are places where energy is really distorted. I mean, any human rights violation, any abuse of power, that's a real contraction of that energy. It's a real, um, 
Yeah. So yeah. staying out of that is helpful. Absolutely. Um, there's something I, I, I'd like to just, you know, and probably many people in the in the in our uh, teaching community and the, for the uh, future teachers, um, you've you know something that you really had in common with Emily Conrad was your uh, initiation or your initiatory path in uh, IT. It's very hard to say in French, this, you know, IT, we say IT in French, but it's very hard to <laughs> pronounce it in English. I'd like to know what, what was your motive, you know, what, what were the context that brought you to, to, to the mm. Bodu tradition and all this, you know, like very, very specific shamanism. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because it's not, it's definitely not something I sought. You know, there are definitely places where one can in these days google but previously like look in the newspaper or listen to the radio and say you know a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars get initiated wasn't like that at all um i think actually it's worthy of of like just a little commentary about my relationship to dance which was one of the portals in i love to dance when I was young, I would sneak out at two, three in the morning and go to the ocean's edge when we were on vacation in Cape Cod and, you know, dance to the wind and get out on the rock jetties that go out. Um, probably would terrify my parents to know what I was doing. And then um, I started to take dance classes and I loved them. Ballroom, jazz, et cetera, et cetera. Never really found home mm -hmm. until I found Haitian dance. And it was actually Catherine Dunham herself, unbeknownst to me, who was watching a Dunham technique class I was in and called me over. And mm -hmm. it, I was very insulted by what she said. She said, you should do traditional Haitian. That's what's in your body. And I was like, Arr! you know, and, and then I found out who she was. <laughs> and, you know, how many years ago? That was in the mid 80s. So 30 years later, hundreds of trips to Haiti, living in Haiti. Um, the dance called me in, you know, your first question was what called me, the dance called me home. Mm -hmm. And the more I danced, the more I wanted to know the dance deeply. And so I went to Haiti when I was doing my thesis in dance movement therapy, um, social trauma, looking at traditional Vodou, you know, the sacred dances of Vodou and, um, dance therapy. And I think it was probably my second or third trip. Um, that was my very first trip. My husband, Carl, who you know, was with me and we flew to Cap Icien in the North coast and had, you know, a friend of a friend of a friend and said, um, we said, it might be kind of cool to go to a ceremony. So he said, when you get to the Cap Icien airport, ask for this guy, Mano, who was the head of security at the airport at that time. And we asked for him and like, I don't know, 48 hours later, he was picking us up and we went to a ceremony and, um, the officiating mumbo, Ingrid Yera, was, um, who's a sister of mine now. Her mother officiated my mother's uh, Casa Canary when Manchun died. So, um, in fact, we were going to do a ceremony together in Miami in May, but that's not happening. Anyways, she dragged me. She literally dragged me out of the ceremony and sat me down and started talking to me in, in broken English and Creole about my path in Haiti and with the children and with the spirits. And um, that, yeah. And so I kept going back, called by the dance, and then met Manchun, who did the same thing. She, the first time I met her at a ceremony, she dragged me into the inner chamber where an initiate was and put me to work instantly. Uh -huh. And um, she just kept saying, you'll be back. So I have a feeling, well, actually, Emily and I talked about this quite a bit. She was never public with her Haitian Oh. initiation and one of the last conversations I had with her before she died she did say to me don't ever let the teaching community forget Haiti mm -hmm. don't ever let anybody in continuum forget Haiti mm -hmm. I have not you know she said I've not been vocal about it but you can be she'd read the chapter I wrote called continuum at the edge where I talk, where I write a bit about it so um we did talk about that initiation process and the things that you can and can't talk about as an initiate you know with yeah. other but about um the being called in and the unexpectedness of being a blanc mm -hmm. which is literally means white but it's foreigner it's used generally in haiti and being called into that tradition and how 
the demands of serving for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, she kept saying to me, this is, this is how I serve Dambala. This is how I serve, you know, continuum is how I serve. Um, so it's, it's, I mean, I think a lot of people glorify initiation. Mm-hmm. It's a boatload of work if mm-hmm. to become an initiate and to carry a tradition really, like truly. Um, I'm, I'm married to Haiti, you know, and so I'm there in the earthquakes. I was just there in January, um, kidnapping everywhere, you know, no, I mean, it was in this now with COVID it's, it's terrible down there. I, you know, that I serve. Yeah. It's not waving a rattle and dance. It's I serve. I, you know, Thank so, you so and much really for- did too. Yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you so much for really being precise with those things because, as you said, we sometimes have preconceived idea about, you know, like kind of... Um, and, uh, you know, you said in one of the interviews that I could watch on online about anatomy and geography and this relationship. And um, for me, knowing you and knowing the, how you do this work and the different layers you're combining... It's very much actually. It looks very much like a planetary plan, planetary work in itself. Yeah. The way you embody a different aspect of the you know the human interaction with the rest of the planet. Interesting. I well, I, I don't know what I said about anatomy and geography, but I, <laughs> I don't remember. But you loved it. You you had a you had a kind of yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I love, I do. I love geography. I love geology. I love looking at layers, which probably relates to psychology. And I love anatomy. No, I mean, our, our, you know, I, um, we have, um, I'm sure that we have magnetic pathway. You know, I know elephants and whales. I've just been reading about this. They follow magnetic pathways. I know we have those. And I remember Emily saying that, I mean, I've trusted her on this, that human connective tissue was, had the same frequency or hertz as the earth. And, yep. you know, now people buy these earthing blankets. Um, all of that. Yeah. I mean, I really feel like we have ley lines, um, possibly similar to what the Aborigines would call song lines. I've, yep. I've heard them sung and I'm not, no expert on them. So I want to be very tender and careful and, you know, not culturally appropriating, but we have these ley lines, we have these energy lines. I mean, it, I'm sure it's part of our formation. I mean, yes, there's the midline that we are organized around and, you know, Mm -hmm. in utero and all of that. I'm sure that there are magnetic lines that connect my body to your body, your body to your ancestors, my ancestors, the whole earth, all of the species, all of them. Yeah. Absolutely. And with this, just to (laughs) further, uh, I know you've been going to, um, I mean, you've been teaching in places where people can experience continuum and swimming with whales or dolphins and, and having this type of really special and, and I'm sure very powerful experiences. So what, what did you um, learn or realize there in this very mm-hmm. specific space that we can experience sometimes in a dive, in a continuum dive, but... That's a different reality when you're with them. Yeah. The dolphins haven't happened yet because of COVID-19. We had to reschedule. Um, although I've, I've been with dolphins in, in the ocean, you know, we're in, a, in trips or uh, situations where it wasn't planned. Um, the whales, um, and I do want to mention Suzanne Wright, Crane and I ran a um, canine continuum, so we've right. only did it once, but also having dogs in the space. But with the whales, what have I realized? I'm, I'm dropping back in. I've done, I guess it's five. Yeah, so there have been five years in a row. Hopefully I'll be going this year. All depends on countries opening up. Um, I've had so many interactions, but but where your question grounds me or lands me is being in the blue, Mm -hmm. in the blue. And in all the ways that that slows down and amplifies and refines our movement. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and our breathing, mm -hmm. all the ways that I think very physiologically our heart has to work. Mm -hmm. We know this place. We come from that place. Now we're on land. Now we're upright. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're designed physiologically for that. Still in process. I think we're being designed or designing as we go. But going into that blue and the way of meeting, the way of interacting, the way of seeing is so altered and so familiar. Mm -hmm. And last year, actually, um, I had a particular encounter that wasn't one of the, I've had some very close encounters. Mm -hmm. I've literally swam or danced or, you know, I've babysat baby whales that are three or four weeks old and mothers will come up and look you in the eye and go to sleep. If they like you, your babysitter for a while. I've had those kind of interactions, but this one was, I was, um, I, I had an allergic reaction to really extreme mold in New Zealand. And so was a little more challenged in the ocean last year. And I was down there. I occasionally would go down with a GoPro to try to get some footage. I'm not attached to it. And I was mucking around with that stupid camera because you're, you know, underwater and I'm trying to <laughs> And I'm mucking around and these couple whales were swimming around and they, one was a young male. And I remember this moment where I just was like, whoa, something just shifted. Mm -hmm. Something just shifted in this big, I call it big blue love. That's what I call that. It's big blue love. And I looked up and the whale had suspended maybe 20 feet from me and was looking at me. Mm -hmm. And I could feel him saying, put that fucking camera down, right? Just stop. And for months and still, I mean, it's a little more distant. I could smell and taste and feel the water, all water, the blue, the way everything is diluted. It's like, I think it's like alchemy. I think it's like um, essential oils and hydrosols. It's that level of distillation life had become and he just held me in his gaze he didn't just look at me he held me in his gaze mm -hmm. and i met him i reciprocated which i couldn't have done with the camera i couldn't have you know and often when i'm leading groups i'm really tending to them i'm being my nurturing self and we were suspended for a couple minutes before he decided to move on and in that moment, as my, I, I, I don't totally understand um, David um, Bohm's work, but Priscilla, our, our colleague Priscilla um, Auschenkloss, am I saying her name right? Auschenkloss, she's got that beautiful name. I understand it when she talks about it. She's utterly brilliant, but it, talking at the micro, talking about the micro and the macro and the um, implicate and explicate orders and things like that all of those things mm -hmm. were in that moment right. we were pure energy it wasn't even an eyeball taking me in or holding me it was it was definitely heart connection um but it's a depth of being seen in the minuteness of our human form or any form that we exist in for the time that we're here and the vastness of everything that's always existed and not mm -hmm. ocean space. Um, and that particular moment of meeting, it was, it, it was like the most potent and the most diffuse meeting of energies that um, I think of Mary Oliver's poem about the wild geese and, and, you know, having your place in the world of all things. And I think um, humans are good at forgetting that, you know, or, or we've decided that our place is, you know, to race around in cars and on, and to pave over the earth and suffocate her. And, you know, this whole, this whole thing that we call civilization or society is just completely made up. Mm -hmm. That is, I think that's what I've realized is that we really have an important essential that we're not, role that we're not tending to, mm -hmm. and it's minutia. Mm -hmm. Everything is, I don't want to say everything is set. Everything is set in its fluid, chaotic, unraveling, unfolding, ever dreaming order. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. Wow, yeah. that sounds like a really an amazing state to uh, to reach. It sounds very much like 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 the hum recognition recognition of consciousness um, itself somehow. You just said it a lot more succinctly than I did. Yeah, that's. That's yeah, that's probably what it was. And it's interesting because I think of other, you know, one other time that just I won't describe it that pops in was my initiation. There were a few moments in my initiation and the things that happened mm -hmm. when I was ensconced in an inner chamber for seven days. Um, and another time that was on an airplane of all places. And it was, you know, long story short, I had to fly from Bali to Jakarta and my flight was can all these flights were canceled and there was one brand new airline with this really limp looking station in the airport who had seats and I thought oh this is it and I'm up there going are your planes okay so, you know and I get on this kind of old airplane and you know I'm dealing with all the human fear about you know I had to buy a new ticket I mean just all this and this is you know you know are we going to get over the ocean it's not that long of, you know, just, and there was this woman diagonally, maybe three or four rows up, um, Indonesian woman. I couldn't speak with her. I don't speak um, any of the languages there. And I remember just looking at her and all of a sudden I had the same experience mm -hmm. dropped into energy. And I, you know, peace is a word that I would use calm, but I, I just went into the state of we're just energy moving it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine if this plane plummets into the ocean. It's going to be fine if it goes up into the sky and never comes down and we fly around the universe forever because that's what we're doing anyway. It's going to be fine. And it was a real, it was a very similar experience um, in a very different environment. So I think that's always available to us, you know, and it's, um, <clears throat> I recognize the, the privilege that I have in being able to join those mammoth teachers in the big blue love um they also you know they called me in through the dream world as well but yeah it's always i know you've been very creative as a continuum teacher in bringing these dimension as well i mean we had in Fr in in france like i think five years ago like a ceremonial continuum which included mm -hmm. some of the uh some elements of the um asian tradition and um so how do you it sounds also like knowing you that you're shifting into a different place now in you. And I'm just curious if you can already see or dream what direction your continuum teaching is taking. If maybe it's too early, maybe it's too early to, to ask this question. I don't know, but um, you know, with, with what you just described and, and how now a lot of, of the you know, variety of um, uh, of things you you you've been doing and living and giving to the world, how it all comes together. I mean, you, I think you spoke a little mm -hmm. bit about that in the beginning of the of the interview, but maybe uh, there's something in your teaching of continuum or the way you want to teach continuum uh, that maybe is taking uh, or, or shaping into. Um, yeah. I think it's shaping. I think it's, you know, I think it's dissolving and forming all at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, it's, it's probably not limited to continuum. It's, it's, you know, the online series that I've been doing that was really, I mean, it's whenever there's a disaster or a crisis, I mobilize, right? That's what I do. I respond. And I, I actually thrive in these environments. I love I find it fascinating. I think it's this pandemic is utterly fascinating. And it's 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 verifying a lot of what I've what I've always sensed about our relationship to the world and nature. Um, I mean, we're only five percent human DNA, right? The rest is microbial and viral, and you know, all kinds of little things. Anyways, so but but I think that if um, I think I'm still, um, you know, in the human rights world, we talk about speaking truth to power. So that's one. That's that strong more muscle, more physical expression of the work. I think I, there's still always going to be that in me. Mm -hmm. The spirit, you know, who I serve is, is a warrior spirit. Mm -hmm. And there's also the dissolve. And I know I've been really 
um, really paying attention to the relationship between inner climate and outer climate. Um, <clears throat> that's very polyvagal inspired. Um, Cause you know, I also, there's polyvagal informed dance therapy. There's also polyvagal informed continuum. I call it radical freedom. There's polyvagal informed yoga practices, which I call yoga bala. So there's all these different versions of it. So there's that um, polyvagal, but then there's also what I call the medicine aspect of it and the, the spiritual aspect of it. And it's that, how we connect and, and, you know, I feel like the threads in our evolution, mm -hmm. all creatures are our evolutionary ancestors, if not behind before mm -hmm. on the tree of life, we are not on the same branch as birds, but I still believe humans, the whole thing, for, you know, the whole quest for flying mm -hmm. comes from whatever moment in time, right. embodied right. sensing moment, we sense the possibility of flight. Um, so um, I where my work, I think, is going or being guided to, facilitated by Sa Nu Pa Wei, the ever-present unseen, is more interactions, more, Emily called it species inclusivity. Right. You know, although Continuum still stayed fairly privileged, small group of humans. I'm really interested, as I think many of us are now in, minimizing i'd love to reduce all power differentials i'd love them to just go away i'm sick of them but minimizing eliminating power differentials not just culturally not just people so that we really take our place in the world and i think continuum is one is, pro is possibly one of the most powerful movement in life practices to do that right <clears throat> because it does have the potential to be quite non-hierarchical yeah <clears throat> I mean, I remember Emily talking about hierarchy and, you know, that we were taking our power back and, you know, there's some of that and then there's some of that that's not true because, again, it's remained in a fairly, I think, privileged context. Um, so, I, you know, I think that's the next way for all of us and I know that's where my dreaming is taking me is how to manifest that in this form. I stopped teaching classes in Santa Fe. Um, I've been teaching the same dot, you know, monthly dives for years. I was just like, no, something different. And it, it is, it's still forming. You're right. I feel like you can, you sense me. It's forming. I don't quite know how it's going to show up. Definitely more retreats where we get to be with other species, where we get to really learn deep listening. Right. Um, I've changed the way that I, te I really like the way I taught last year in last year's dancing the wild home retreat. It wasn't, I don't know if this is true for all of us, but, you know, every now and then I'll be like, well, you know, we layer the sounds, we do the dive. It was very different. Mm -hmm. I went out and I listened to the ocean every day and I really felt into the group. I often haven't, I've met some of them usually, but not all of them. And I try, I'm like, what's the bridge? Here's that bridge word again. What's the bridge? Mm -hmm. Somebody going to be afraid of having a snorkel in their mouth. Is somebody going to be afraid of big waves? Mm -hmm. And I take all the things that we're challenged with that we meet so intimately in that Big blue love, which is often choppy, cold, stormy, murky. There ain't just whales there. Every now and then a shark friend shows up. What will help bridge? What makes us at home? What restores our sense of returning home to the ocean? And that's what we worked with. Oh, I love that. So sometimes oh, yeah. it looks like a continuum dive and sometimes it looked different. Well, you have to come sometime. You yeah. would love it. <laughs> You would probably swim off and I would be like, Sylvain, Sylvain, come back. <laughs> but that would be okay. Yeah, I, 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 love, I love this uh, because that's really, I feel what, <clears throat> excuse me, what, what we are needed right now is this to find a way to bridge more and to, to connect more to, uh, because it doesn't look so nice sometimes. Sometimes it, it does look really nice and sometimes it's very appealing and sometimes it's cold and sometimes it's, strong and sometimes it can be dangerous and some yeah but yeah i yeah no i remember my first trip which i was not not my retreat i was getting to know the place and getting to know some of the people there to see if it was a match and i happened to find myself on a free mostly free diving trip with about eight people who were all 20 to 30 years younger than me experienced free divers a lot of aussie brawn you know and then you know they were they were pretty good but 
But there was one time in the very beginning of the trip where, and I'm a strong swimmer. I used to be a lifeguard in the ocean, but still I hadn't, I live in New Mexico. So, and um, they got really excited about something and, you know, just took off. I think forgot I was there. And all of a sudden the boat's probably 400 meters away. The ocean's big and gray. And I, you know, I don't have, I, Jaws messed me up as it did many people. I used to swim a mile in the ocean every day when I lived in the East Coast. You know, and then there was that dun dun movie. Anyways, I'm out there and I'm looking at the boat and you can call the boat over if, and I'm feeling the rough. The waves were probably, you know, three to four foot chop, not, not huge watching them swim and I had this moment I seized up and like it was panic it was that sympathetic parasympathetic freeze that happened I just seized up and I started to wait for the boat and then I went wait a minute you chose this you chose this and I could hear Emily talking about you know ocean is home and I was thinking just the way that everything will download in you at once and I'm like just look under the water so I put my mask on and I looked around, you know, and I was like, okay, there's nothing coming up. There's no problem. If you see fins on the surface, it's if they're underneath you. I'm like, just go. I just look down occasionally. And, you know, they finally realized they'd left me behind. And one of the young guys swam back, you know, and I was fine once I got going. And I was just like, um, you know, but it was this moment. I remember I just stopped for this moment. I'm like, you chose this. Mm-hmm. And that was a really powerful statement because it was like, I chose to be on that trip. I chose to be in that ocean. Part of it was I wanted to heal my relationship with the ocean because, I mean, it's a little dramatic to say Jaws ruined it, but that movie really did mess with a lot of people's psyche about the ocean. Absolutely. But I also chose, it's like, I chose this incarnation. Mm -hmm. On some level, I chose to be here now. I chose this body. I chose, like, the word I chose this was amplified so far. And it was just, it was another one of those moments that I wasn't interacting with a human or a species. It was just what it was, you know, we were way out we were way out and it was, it was powerful. Um, really, really powerful. So yes, it's not always comfortable. Um, survival is a powerful teacher. It's the heart of the vitality of life. Um, it's why we're here. And I think exploring that depth of, vulnerability allowing us to be vulnerable and the eyes heart spine of the earth and the ocean and all of our creatures is really important um we need to know that we're not always in charge we're never in charge actually that illusion <laughs> well thank you so much it's really great to uh, to hear <clears throat> <clears throat> how all those experiences like shaped you know what you're offering right now and and i'm so grateful to know you and so grateful that you are spreading this um wisdom all over the planet so um, i'm gonna mirror that back to you i'm gonna mirror that back to you you too you know i i mean i love you so long you know that (laughs) great so anyway looking forward (laughs) to connect in real real life yes sometime soon and thank you for taking the time and thank you uh,